I would say that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we are, we're definitely headed for, you know, social unrest, supply chain disruptions are going to continue in the future. Um, you know, if we, if we can't learn our lesson from COVID, it's about our supply chains and our food and made everybody much more aware of where their food's coming from. Um, I don't, I, I really don't know what will, you know, you have to be as self-sufficient as you can and you'll know, eat as local as you can. You know, every, every mile that food has to travel is just extra cost, extra expense, and it's extra energy. Where the only constant in life is change, you need to be ready. This is the Man Made Survival Show. Hello everyone, my name is Jose Prado with Women Survival. Thank you so much for coming back to the channel and watching this video. Today we have a very interesting person for you today. He's going to teach us a lot about ranching and stuff. And this is Red Hills Rancher that is here with me today. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jose. Thanks for having me on and uh, looking forward to having a good conversation with you. Awesome. Me too. You know, um, I, I just started doing these conversations with people, these interviews. And people really like it, so I'm really forward looking on to what you have to share with us today. Good deal. All right, so what I want to get to is, you know, you're, you're a rancher, so you're doing this every single day. And one of the things that paper, the prep, in the prepper community would think about is that one day, which is going to, you know, when crack hits the fan, we're going to start ranching, and then, you know, we're going to survive it all. So my question is, you know, just to start off the conversation is, do you think that people could just start ranching out of nowhere without having any experience or any knowledge or even the equipment that they would have, you know, that they would have to have on hand so they can have rank uh, or start ranching successfully? What's your take on that? Ooh, let me see if I can, uh, let me see if I can remember to try to cover all that. So it might seem pretty simple what, uh, what we do, but, in reality, it takes a lifetime of learning and you have to be a dedicated lifelong learner and, and apply yourself to the craft of, of ranching and animal husbandry and land stewardship. Um, any education is, uh, <laughs> education is always expensive because it's worth it and it goes doubly so on ranching. Um, you're going to pay for all the education you get and whether you pay for that up front by getting some schooling, some training, finding a good mentor, um, or you pay for it the hard way um, with experience and losing a lot of money. Yeah, right, right. Um, so uh, before the show, we visited for a minute about, um, you know, about supply chains and in the prepper community. And um, I, I think of myself as a prepper um, and that I kind of come by that naturally by just by where I'm from and how I've always lived my life you know when when town is 20 miles away you don't buy two rolls of toilet paper you buy a case of toilet paper yeah, right you know when you get down to having 12 rolls left you go buy another case you know so when things like the pandemic hit you know everybody's buying toilet paper I'm like well you know we're good for like two months we just need to make sure that you know we maintain that minimum stockpile and that minimum stove and kind of the same thing with food we always maintain you know, we always keep a lot of food. Our freezers are almost always full of meat. We keep plenty of canned foods around. We keep, uh, you know, vegetables and stuff in dry storage. So the pandemic has exposed the fragility of the supply chains, not just the meat supply chains, uh, specifically the beef industry, which we can circle back to that later. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's also exposed the fragility of all the global trade and the global supply chains. And I think people are getting much, much more aware of how they're spending their food dollar and how far that food travels, you know, in, in its whole life, because, you know, that's all energy, right? Right. Yeah. And, and as I understand it, energy has a lot to do with, with farming and ranching, because if, if the price of fuel goes up, so will the expense of, of me and, and the, you know, pretty much ending up at the grocery store, that's where we're going to see the difference. Okay, so thinking about the, uh, the traditional commodity production agriculture model where, you know, you raise a, raise a cow, it's calf's on grass for 18 months, then it goes down in a feedlot for six months, fattens up on corn, soy, and forage, and then goes, goes to the packing plant. So the, the, 
costs don't change much on the cattleman end, on the you know on the commercial cattleman side, until you know you're trying to put those calves, you know, when they're six months to a year old, and you're trying to place them and figure out how to grow them and figure out how to market them eventually. So, uh, crap! What was I saying? <laughs> lost my I, thought, I lost my train of thought. I don't know. It's fine. We were talking about the. Okay. Uh, so okay. All right. I found it. So. There's not much, you know, when those cattle are eating grass and a cow's just standing on grass and that's basically all she's eating, that's a very, very low energy input system, right? Every, every time you have to haul feed to that animal, whether it's hay, okay? So you're gonna go get a hay bale and you're gonna haul it out to your cows. Well, you gotta go start your pickup. You gotta pick up that 2000 pound hay bale and you gotta haul it out to your cows. And that hay bale also represents a very significant investment in time, money, machinery, and diesel fuel, you know, to grow that hay, to harvest it, and to transport it. So I'm on the regenerative side. Now back on the production side, you know, you're feeding that hay and then the corn. So we can take that corn too, and we're gonna put that in an animal. And if you wanna, if you want to really get into the weeds about why feeding grain to animals is, is probably something we shouldn't do, you need to listen to Joel Salatin. Um, anyway, so all this corn and soy that we feed to these animals, you know, that's also, you know, a very energy intensive process to grow. It takes, you know, big tractors pulling deep tools to rip up the ground and you know then we have to plant the special patented Monsanto seed and then we have to put the special herbicide on it we have to put the special fertilizer on it and then we have to pump water from hundreds of feet underground using yet more fossil fuels to put on this corn because it's a thirsty crop mm -hmm. you know and then we're going to cut that with a combine and then haul it with a truck and you know, we're, we turn that into ethanol and think that that's like we're actually manufacturing energy. I mean, it's, it's kind of a shell game when you get down to it and actually follow the money around. Right. You know, and we feed that stuff to our cattle and that, you know, those corn and those grains represent such a huge energy and energy investment to feed to an animal. And in, in the entire history of, of human beings in 5,000 years since we discovered farming and and became civilized. It's only been in the last 60 years that grain has been cheap enough to feed the animals. Oh, okay. So, so let so if we put that in perspective of a, a apocalyptic scenario, so it would it would be really expensive and really hard to feed cattle. No, I mean it'd be hard to continue feeding cattle the way we are now. You know, especially if you know, input costs increase because, you know, all those synthetic chemicals that they need to, you know, maintain that system, you know, herbicides, pesticides, insecticides, fertilizers, most of those are synthesized from oil or natural gas. So, you know, if the price of that goes up, it, it, it's a cascading effect. But really, when it gets right down to it, you know, a lot of these things in the commodity system are just, you know, the replacements for human labor and human creativity, because at the end of the day, the only energy we have is solar energy, and we have to feed as many people as we can. It, we have to feed, we have to feed people, and we have to do a much better job of being efficient at harnessing the sunlight and turning it into protein and not subsidizing it with, with cheap energy from the past. Okay. So what, what have you noticed now that with the supply chain, you know, we saw that, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, or you know, a few weeks into it, they they shut down the the processing plants and all that. How did that affect the ranchers around your area, or you know, a large since you're in the industry? Oh goodness. Um, now I'll I'll say I'm not on the feeding end of the industry. Like I'm more on the commercial cattle and the custom grazing side. So, um, so, so what's the difference, real quick? So just so we know. On the feeding backgrounding side, you know, that's more the animals that are that are going into the commodity system, you know, that are growing calves that go stand in a feedlot, you know, for, for production agriculture. Um, I, I've mostly been a custom, in the custom grazing business. Um, so real quick, my family's owned this, owned this land um, for over a hundred years, uh, oh. but up until 1985, it was leased out and, and operated by other people. And in 1985, my father got the opportunity to, uh, to take over management of the ranch. So he pretty much ran it from 
85 up till about 2014, 2015. And then I started taking over almost everything by then. And the last three, four years, he's, he's kind of set in the back seat. And when he started his business, he never had the capital to buy cattle. And his focus was on improving the land and managing the land. And to him, the cattle were just a tool to do that. Um, so he, he was never interested in owning any animals himself. Um, so that means the ranch was kind of like a hotel for cows. Okay, you have a certain number of cows. I say, okay, this is the price per head per day and I will take care of your cows for this many days. So now that I have, now that I have my own cow herd, um, eventually I wanna be completely vertically integrated from, from calf to consumer. I wanna be able to, you know, actually be able to hand somebody a cut of meat that I raised, you know, that I made the breeding decision on, that I raised, that I fed, and I cared for its entire life. And then it had one bad day and we put it in the box. Um, that's what I eventually want to be able to offer my customer. But right now, you know, in order to get there, I'm going to have to put some animals into that system. So my calves are going to leave here. They're going to go to the sale barn. They're going to get sold and they're going to go to a background. And what a backgrounder is going to do is he's going to make sure that they're healthy and they're going to gain weight and they'll put together like a lot of different little size packages and, you know, they'll buy some gray cattle over here. They'll buy some red cattle over here and they'll buy some black cattle over here and they'll put them all together in kind of matchy matchy sets. And they start feeding those out and growing them. And then they, you know, will generally sell them to a feedlot operator or sometimes they own that animal all the way through the feedlot and then sell it directly to the packer. And then they can get the data back on how the carcass yields and whatnot. Um, did that kind of cover what you're what you're wanting to know? Yeah, 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 it did. I mean, the the cattle business is a cattle business is really huge and really complex. And something something I want everybody to understand is everybody's going to do things different because everybody is operating under a different set of business, you know, under a different business rules, business goals, and under a different vision and mission statement. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, so back, going back to the, the uh, supply chain, what, what have you noticed or what have you seen, you know, the impact of all of this, ha having to shut down certain aspects of it and stuff like that? Well, or what has been the rumors around the... Okay, so what we've seen is we've seen the cattle market, like the bottom is kind of falling out of the cattle market. And yes, there are a few other drivers on that right now, but... You know, we talk about supply chain disruptions through March, April, May, June, and July, and there was a lot of COVID disruption, and that has to do with the concentration of the meat packing. okay? It wasn't that we had problems with the supply being restricted. It wasn't problem, we had problems with moving any of the supply anywhere. It was in these big giant meat packing plants, they want to run so fast because they have to pay a fixed expense of a government inspector to inspect that meat. Okay, and if the government says, your inspectors can inspect 6,000 carcasses a day, that plant is gonna run 5,999. And they're gonna have enough guys down that line to where each guy only has to make the minimum amount of knife cuts in order to process that 6,000 cattle a day. If they process more than that, they may have to pay a fine to the, they may have to pay a fine or pay overtime for the inspector. If they process less than that, they're adding additional cost into each animal by not being as efficient as they can. So they pack all these people in, you know, and they're super close, you know, they're shoulder to shoulder and these guys are wielding knives and they're, they're processing carcasses. Well, COVID comes and we got to space those people out. We got to slow those lines down. So the costs go up and see, this is, this is a trap that, that I can kind of go down with myself and, and talking about minimum wage and food price. So, you know, it takes X amount of labor units to process that carcass. That carcass represents Y amount of protein, okay? If we have to all of a sudden have to put in double the amount of labor units into that carcass, you know, that's a lot more time and energy we had to put in it, and that's a lot more wages we have to pay. And where do you think the packer is going to, you know, pay that? They're not going to, you know, they're not going to cut that cost somewhere else. They're going to pay me less for my cattle. 
you know. Right. Just last just last week, the JBS, one of the four largest meat packers in the world. They're headquartered in Brazil. They just got slapped with a two hundred and eighty million dollar fine for bribery charges. Like, and and these guys, these Batista brothers, I mean, like, they have been fined repeatedly in Brazil by the Brazilian government for shady business practices. But we allow them free access to our markets. We import beef from. We import Brazilian beef from these guys. And like, I mean, they're they're, they're it's it's pretty criminal behavior. Mm-hmm. You know, speaking of imports, so the U.S. has imported 2.3 billion pounds of beef so far in 2020. Like, that's a huge increase from last year. Like, huge increase from last year. So you got to ask yourself, why? Why are we importing 2.3 billion pounds of meat? If the American rancher is struggling against almost record low cattle prices, I was watching a cow sale today in Wilcox, Arizona. Whew, I'm glad I'm not in a position where I absolutely have to sell anything or have to generate any cash flow. Man, the market is just brutal right now. But the flip side of that is it's a good time to buy cows. So I'm apparently buying more cows this week and next week. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And, and but. Pretty much that would also end up, like you were talking about, if they have to space the people and they're putting more money into it, that would also make the customer pay more money for the meat, right? You'd think that, but, you know, have, have you seen any, you know, yeah, okay, prices went up at the super, prices went up at the supermarket. You know, that was a fact. And... <sighs> Over the years, the way the U.S. market kind of evolved, you know, how many people, you know, we saw this in March, April, May, June, and July, you know, eating, everybody's eating habits had to shift so much, you know, there were so many products that had to get thrown out, you know, there's entire barns full of pigs and chickens that had to get euthanized, because those, you know, and the story they're not telling you is maybe some of those pigs were going to be the McRibs. Mm-hmm. And McDonald's realized that they weren't going to sell any McRibs and they canceled that contract. Okay. You know, or those chickens were going to be, you know, next, you know, the summer's spicy nuggets at Wendy's and they canceled the order. So, you know, then you have to kill a whole barn full, of, you know, then they have to euthanize a whole barn full of animals and it's just absolutely horrible. Thank God we didn't have to do that in the cattle industry. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I do remember when, when, a few months ago, they were talking about the, 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 the ranchers, you know, people that have the pigs and the chickens and everything. They were losing almost $400,000 a month just on euthanizing the animals because they couldn't get them processed. But I do remember they were saying because of uh, shutting down the, the processing plants. But, I mean, it's a good thing that Trump, you know, pretty much passed the, the executive order saying that they have to stay open, right? Uh I'd say yes and no. I mean, to some extent, the meat packers kind of realize how much authority and, and control they have. When you put four companies in charge of almost 85% of any market, yeah. I mean, there's collusion, there's, you know, they're, they're working together to fix prices and drive prices down. You know, in a lot of markets, there's, there's, in a lot of weeks, there's only one company coming and competing for cattle at a feedlot. Um, Increased in competition uh, would be something, and I got off track from your question. I apologize. No, no, no. I was just uh, saying that uh, it's a good thing that Trump pretty much told them to stay open so they can process all these meat. I don't think they had a choice. I mean, honestly, they don't. They, I don't think they really had much of a choice. I mean, they knew they had to continue, and they knew they had to. They had to do something. The alternative was letting the supply chain completely fail. And I, there's some really scary implications to the meat supply chain completely coming to a halt and seizing up, even, even if it is for a very, very short period of time. You know, these, these big meat packing plants are, you know, so phenomenally huge and they, you know, process so many cattle. Like we saw this with the Tyson fire um, in 2019. You know, that took out a significant portion of the nation's processing capacity. One building was like almost 9, 10, 12 percent 
of, of, the, na of the national kill capacity every day. One plant, like you can't tell me that kind of concentration is good. No, no, of course not. So what, what, you know, since, what do you think would happen if, if it would have just completely halted back in April? Like there was no, no opening, everybody shut down. What would happen? You know, uh, <laughs> two weeks. It takes about two weeks and everybody would be completely out of food. Oh, wow. And, you know, it, you know, we're seeing it with you know, other parts of the economy. It, you can't just flip a switch and everything comes back online. Right. You know, the cattle production pipeline is a two to two and a half year process. You know, from the time that, you know, you breed that animal till the time that it's, you know, to make a breeding decision to make, you know, to have that calf on the ground, you know, it takes nine months, then you get your calf. And then it takes two to two and a half years to grow that calf to market weight, market size. So, so it, would, it would be like a three year delay if it would have completely stopped. Yeah. And it, and you know, there's, there's big disruptions all, all up and down the supply chain. If everything comes to a halt Right. and you know, things, things never came to a halt, but they got so backed up and slowed down and slowed down. So a number is 600,000. So 600,000 is roughly how many the average weekly kill is during the summer. Oh, wow. There was a good portion of the summer where they were doing less than half of that or really close to half of that. So that backs every, that backs up that whole supply chain. And it takes time to clear that backlog for every week of backlog. It takes two to clear. Like they just got back. I think it was back in August, first part of August, that they started getting in front of the backlog and the kill finally got back around 600,000 and over. But it's just taking so long to chew through that backlog because almost every day that they're at that reduced capacity added four or five days of backlog. It takes four or five days to clear that backlog. So they're still, they're still chewing through it. Um, uh, I, mentioned, I mentioned low cattle prices and the bottom falling out of the cattle market. Um, you know, COVID certainly hasn't helped uh, widespread drought right now going on in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas spreading up into Kansas and Southern Colorado is, uh, is not a great thing. Uh, right now, like the cattle market would be depending on wheat pasture, um, on wheat to come up. So guys would go buy calves to turn out on wheat pasture. And if it doesn't rain, there's not going to be any wheat pasture. So nobody's buying wheat pasture calves. So the <laughs> market's low and it, it, it kind of feeds on itself, I guess. So it's a lot fragile than people really understand that it is because just one little disruption can really back it up to where, you know, it would really hurt people because we've seen at the grocery stores, I've experienced that in my, you know, myself and I live in a rural area and, uh, you know, there's not a lot of people in my town and all that meat just flew off the shelf and it was really hard for it to come back on. So, you know, I did videos on that and everything in the past, but, we, I guess the understanding is not really there unless, unless you're in the industry and you know what's going on, you know what other ranchers are talking about and what their concerns are. So, I mean, it's really important that you bring this information. I appreciate it. Oh, and I'm sure I'll, I'll get plenty of hate mail for, for most of the things I've said, and that's okay. I've got thick skin and I can take a hater. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, you know, generally speaking... You know, so most of my commercial cattlemen friends, you know, they're, they're concerned, they're worried, um, and they're, they're taking some measures to protect their businesses financially and economically. Um, I'm, I'm generally not, con not concerned with the downturn in the cattle market. You know, it'll come back and plus it's, a, you know, when you're buying stuff in a down market, you're probably making money on it and instead of when you're buying it when it's good and selling it when it's not. Um, kind of waited a few years for an opportunity like this and you know it sucks to take it you know sucks to feel like you're taking advantage of something but um you know good planning good business sense put me in a position where i can take advantage of of, of a low point in the market right right yeah i mean that makes sense that makes sense completely um the uh second but big picture right so the thing the biggest thing that everybody could do is is vote with your food dollar 
you know, and follow your food dollar, trace that food dollar and see how far it's really going. And the best thing you can do is shake the hand that feeds you. You know, if you're going to go to the farmer's market and you're going to look somebody in the eye, you know, you're going to pick up, you know, some greens, you're going to pick up some broccoli, you're going to pick up some potatoes, you know, then you're going to go over there and you're going to pick up some meat, you know, and you could look that person in the eye, you know, and, and if you don't believe that they're selling you a quality product that they put their heart and soul into, by all means, go back to Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. You know, go back to Walmart and support a multi, you know, support multi, multinational companies. You know, the more we work on our local food systems and keeping our food dollars local and rebuilding local food economies, the more resiliency we build back into our lives and our communities. Yeah, and that's going to be an important important thing that would happen if crap hit the fan, because we're going to depend on the on the on the farmers on the ranchers to feed us. Because, you know, if the supply chain is, gets completely disrupted, then people can bet their bottom dollar that they're not going to find things at the store. And right now we're having difficulty just finding things that we used to find very easily just before COVID. And, and the thing is that the writing has been on the wall for a while because we have had, you know, ranchers and, and farmers saying that because of winter, how hard it has been. And, you know, everything gets frozen to the point where they can even harvest it you know, we're going to eventually feel that pain. You know, the environmentalists, the, the crazy lefties, for lack of a better term, they say we got 60 harvests left of soil. And they're probably not very far off. And, you know, while we're here and, and bringing up controversy, you know, climate change, I don't want to debate whether it's man-made or not. The climate's changing and we need to learn how to adapt to it. We circle back to the, that soil question. Um, America's number one agricultural export is soil. We export almost 70 billion tons of topsoil every year. And that's about seven to 10 times as much mass of food as we export or even grow period. So, for every, in a, in a conventional monocrop system where there's a lot of fallow and a lot of tillage and you see a lot of bare soil, um, there's between five and 10 tons of topsoil loss per acre a year. Okay, and put that in perspective. Here they grow a lot of wheat. So wheat weighs about 60 pounds a bushel and in a good year they'll grow about 50, 50 bushels to the acre. So that's 3,000 pounds of wheat per acre and you're going to lose five to ten tons of topsoil per acre to do that and if in case anybody wants to argue i'll say that five tons of topsoil spread out over an acre is half the thickness of a dime hmm. so you, you know there was an article just the other day about uh i think it was usa today said something about dust bowl 2.0 talking about a lot of the dust blowing in right. the plain states We've got fallow bare dirt that's been tilled and the, you know, all, the, all the health on all the biology has been worked out of the soil and all, it's just, it's dead. And then the wind picks it up and blows it off. Covered soil doesn't blow. Hmm. You know, I, ha I had not heard about that before. That's very interesting. I have to look into that. Well, you heard about the Dust Bowl, right? Back in the well, 30s? Yeah, what, what I meant is that about exporting topsoil. I, I had not heard about that before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You connect that 70 tons, that 70 billion tons. That's literally, you can literally go to the USDA's website and find that number. And it's even a couple of years old. Where are we sending it to? Gulf of Mexico. I mean, downstream. Oh. Airborne. You know, it, it blows away or washes away. You know, and people argue, okay, well, a lot of it's dust that it just falls somewhere else. Well, that this is it. you're still missing the point there um but you can't argue about that there isn't a toxic you know a big toxic dead zone in the gulf of mexico right there at the mouth of the mississippi river mm -hmm. herbicide pesticide runoff soil runoff I, I i can see it i can see the link right yeah all right so huh I gotta look into that. That that is really interesting. I, I've never heard about about that before. But hey, 
I'm glad you're on the show. See, I learned something new. I appreciate it. Oh, happy to happy to help. I always try to drop a little nugget here and there. All right. Uh, so let, let's move on to um, to something else. What's carbon uh, cycling? Well, something I kind of talked about earlier. You know, I've been talking about energy a little bit. Right. Okay. And carbon, carbon sequestration, and you know, trying to pull the carbon out of the atmosphere. You know, that that's that's a subject to think. You know, people are talking about that all the time. You know, they're trying to find ways to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it back in the soil. And for years, we thought trees, trees are great. You know, we just let all the trees grow and, you know, because trees make air and, you know, wood's full of carbon and it'll sequester everything. But we're learning that grasslands can sequester far more carbon than forest lands. Perennial polyculture grasslands can sequester carbon. And the way that we can drive that carbon pump is through properly managed grazing. Let the plants grow up real tall, real nice. Then you bring in a lot of animals and a lot of density, eat it down, and what they don't eat, you smash down to the ground. You smash all those carbon-rich stalks and leaves down to the ground, and they put them in ground contact, and the cattle or you know, the ruminants are peeing on them, pooping on them, and stepping on them and turning all that up with dirt, and that accelerates the biology, and that plant matter breaks down and becomes carbon in the soil hmm. and it gets and it gets stored in the soil like there, there's studies out there um i don't have link links off the top of my head or, or really be able to direct you but i might be able to come up with something later and email you um the potential to sequester carbon in the great plains is like in gigatons not gigatons an acre rain, but t several tons per acre. And we're talking about gigatons of carbon sequestration possible all up and down the Great Plains. And it's been proven possible. All right. And how would that change the United States? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, my crystal ball is not that good. I mean, okay. it, it, would, it, would be, it would be a big fundamental change. Um, and I, I honestly don't know what that would look like. Um, there'd have to be a lot more people out working the land. Um, you know, a lot more people passionate about where their food came from um, in order to get there. There'd have to be some kind of unified, holistic vision of, of, of what we wanted the Great Plains to be and how we wanted our lives to be in the future. Yeah, because uh, we have a, a lot of food coming from, from the Great Plains, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Yeah. So for, for as far as preppers, what would you recommend for them to, to do if they wanted to start, you know, growing cattle on their own because they see that what's going on with the election or, you know, potentially we're going to go to war with China with all the things that's going on right now, you know, all the back and forth, even uh, Pompeo trying to create an Asian NATO and everything. And, you know, they, they, they think that they want to start raising animals. And cattle would be one of them. How, how would you tell them to start off? I'd tell them that you generally need a lot of land for cattle. And as far as ruminant species go, or even as, as far as livestock species grow, cattle are actually toward the lower end on profit margins, if you could believe that. Hmm. And, you know, th that even fits in with the direct marketing model. You know, just the labor, time, and resources it takes to grow a beef um, it is greater than, say, to grow the equivalent amount of pounds of rabbit or chicken or turkey. Right. So what I would recommend if, you know, if you don't have a lot of space to start with cows, because cows are expensive and they eat a lot. And, you know, that's a commitment. Start a little smaller. You know, rabbits. I know some people like to keep fl fluffy rabbits as pets. That's okay. Some people like to eat them. I don't. I don't keep rabbits. <laughs> but I know people that do, and they raise meat rabbits. Um, yard poultry is always a good option. Um, Joel Salatin, like, has a has a terrific book um, that I recommend. It's called "Folks, This Ain't Normal." Like, I've been listening to it on audiobook. I'm going back through it for my second try, and it's. I listen to it, and every once in a while, I have to pull over and write down a good quote because it's it's a good book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, being small and being diversified, 
I think that's the key. Um, integrating, integrating species, you know, nature is a polyculture and nature wants to be a polyculture. Nature doesn't want to be a monoculture, you know. I'm trying to add back sheep and goats to the ranch because the ranch needs another class of ruminants to bring their own unique microbiome and biology to the ranch. Similarly, here at the house, we've got chickens and ducks. And hopefully next year, we're going to add a couple of goats down here and maybe some geese and a couple of turkeys. But what I'm saying is, you know, start on what, you know, whatever scale makes sense for you and you have to pick an inter enterprise that fits your resource base for lack of a better way to put it. Okay. So about how many, it, it doesn't make sense if you have, you know, if you only have a half acre yard to go right. buy three cows and then go buy hay bales to feed hay bales to your cows all year. I mean, they've got legs, move them to grass. So what would be the minimum amount of acres that you would need if they wanted to keep, you know, uh, a male and a female so they could, you know, keep the, the cattle going, perhaps. You, you know, know, I, that's, that's one that really you can't answer because it's different everywhere. Um, you go down to the desert in Arizona, it can take two, three, four hundred acres for one cow to live on all year. You go some places, you know, in a high rainfall, non-brittle environment with, you know, tremendous amount of forage production, um, and you can keep... 20 cows on one acre hmm. and, and you know for the same duration just because of the differences of environment differences of forage forage quantity and quality right so it it's it's different everywhere but the in our there there is a government agency the natural resource conservation service um they generally would be able to point somebody in the right direction of you know for an area of how many acres does it keep, take to keep a cow yeah yeah because that's that's some of the things that, uh, you know, people don't really seem to understand or, you know, some preppers that they just want to have their house to be really small, but they want to have all these yard animals in them. But, you know, there has to be a, a minimum of acre of acreage if you're going to be able to have all your animals, you know, to be able to either, you know, run around, whatever the case may be. And, and they got to eat. Work. Yeah, they got to eat. And if we're talking about a, a crab I see the fence scenario where, you know, there's no grocery stores anymore. There's no tractor supply anymore. And you have to grow your own food. You have to have the space to be able to feed your animals. And not just your animals, but yourself and your family too. Yeah, and, you know, if you can't go to tractor supply and, you know, the banking system has failed, you're going to be able to call up your tr favorite trucker and buy a truckload of hay. You know, probably not. Not going to be able to call up the feed mill and order up another, you know, another batch of feed because they're going to be out of business too, and they're going to be trying to figure out how to feed their people. Exactly. Yeah. So the, there has to be a system, a, a system where, where you have enough acres, and you know, whatever it is that you decide to 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 farm, it could be chickens, rabbits, like you said, goats, sheep, or even cattle. You know, it all depends on on the knowledge that you have, on the space that you have, and the equipment that you have. So for someone who would try to set up a system before anything happened, right? For crappy the fan, what would you say that would need for them to be able to raise cattle and, and keep them healthy and stuff like that? And what to look for, you know, for them to not get sick? Generally, generally, if you understand that you need to keep, you know, about 30 pounds of feed a day for that cow, you know, they want about 30 pounds of, of forage a day. We're talking about a thousand pound animal. Um, and that animal is going to want about 20 to 25 gallons of water a day. As long as you can provide that, um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll probably do okay on a cow. It's, it's making sure that every cow has access to about 30 pounds of forage every day and making sure that, you know, they all have 20 gallons of water to drink. That really starts to become a challenge when you're talking about, you know, three or 400 of them. Right. But, um, so a thing I'd want to say is, just because one acre of land can support a cow for a year, that doesn't mean you just should put a cow out there for one year and let it roam around wherever it wants, because there'll be places that'll be absolutely bare and there'll be places that that animal never goes. It'd be much better to only let that animal have just the area that it needs to eat that day and let it eat everything there and then move it 
to another area and give it another buffet. So the analogy is a room with a buffet. So say you and I were going to go sit in a room with a buffet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have a couple options. We can go to a new buffet every day or we can sit here for five days and eat everything we want off this buffet. But here's the catch. They're only going to replace the food we eat on the buffet. <laughs> so if there's something there on the first day that we don't eat on the fifth day, it's going to be stinky. Right. And they're not going to replace it because we're not eating it. So the longer we stay in that room and keep eating on that one buffet, our diet's going to narrow and narrow and narrow and narrow down. And by the end of a month, you and me, we're going to be sharing a pepperoni pizza and afraid to touch anything else on the buffet. Right. Okay. So by moving your cattle every day, you're basically giving them a small buffet every day for them to select off of. And you're giving them a fresh buffet every day for them to select off of. You're concentrating their, their hoof action which stimulates the soil. You're concentrating their manure. You're concentrating their urine, which is free fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, you know, you want to compost. Well, we'll go get some cow manure. Well, make compost in your pasture the natural way by letting your cows stir it up with plant matter. Okay. So maximize the animal impact, but minimize the amount of time that they're there and max and then then that area needs, like after they graze that grass and that forage down, that area needs time to rest and recover before it can be grazed again. So that plant needs to be able to, yeah, but it, well, again, <laughs> okay, you can't, I can't even answer that question with a definite answer right. for where I am here on my ranch because that changes every year. And it's one of those things that I've learned that, you know, I just have to be observant of the temperature and of the rainfall and observant of the grass, right? You know, I'm out looking at the grass every day and I'm observing the grass every day. I'm keeping track of my rainfall, keeping track of the temperature and watching how it grows. When it gets hot and dry, the grass slows down. It doesn't grow as, it doesn't grow as fast, but what we do have is pretty high quality. When it's cool and wet, we get a lot of volume, but it's really low quality. And, and understanding how to make those, make those adjustments in management and make sure the cow's getting what they need to get. I mean, it's taken me 13 years to figure it out. Like I said, it's, there's a lot to it. And I'm always learning, and I'm sure that, you know, I'll, it, it, I'll do this another five years, and I might even be doing something completely different. Yeah, and, and the, the last part that you said has been taking you about 13 years to, to really understand all of this. My philosophy on prepping is that it has to be a way of life rather than just a hobby that people have. Because... A lot of mindset people, yeah it's the, it, but the thing is that people think that they're just going to flip the switch when when the end of the world comes and then they're going to survive it because they've read all the books but they never really practice you know and and you have to have hands-on on all of this so you can understand what what you need you know like like you said you have to look at the grass you have to look at the weather you know how the cow is feeling that day how much is it's eating you know the different kind of diet all of that you can read it, but if you don't have the hands-on experience, you're going to fail. Or, you know, your chances of failing are a lot higher than if you do it every day. You know, you, if you have a yard and you, and you have chickens, you're going to understand You're gonna understand chickens after you've done it for a while. And if anybody asks you a question, you're going to know right there. And then, you know, you're not going to be like, all right, let me look at my book and then try to figure it out. No, you're going to know, right? So that, that is my philosophy, that it has to be a way of life not just a hobby. So we can be successful in whatever it is that may come, whether it's an EMP, whether it's, you know, economic collapse, war, whatever. You're going to have the knowledge, you're going to have the experience on, on what you worked on so you can be successful in your prepping. Yes, I, I agree completely. You know, and a lot of it is a mindset. You know, it's just a mindset of thinking, you know, is this going to be useful later? Is, you know, is this skill going to come in handy down the road? Should I maybe take this bucket of nails and stash it somewhere safe that, you know, so I know that I always have a bucket of nails. So when you really think about it, you know, if the system does completely seize up and crash, you can't build anything because you don't have nails. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I think about stuff like that. 
Yeah, and, and you know, that's the whole premise of preparing, that you, you put everything in place before it's no longer available. So what, where do you see things, let's say five years out, 10 years out, what, what do you see the country being as a whole or, you know, uh, where events may take us? Oh gosh. Well, a thought I've been having the last few days in a conversation that's come up a couple times is failure of empire. Um, all throughout history, you know, the, there have been many great civilizations and many empires that have failed throughout history. In fact, every single one of them up till ours has failed so far. And they've kind of all failed when they've used up their soil and their irrigated agriculture has failed and their leadership could no longer feed mass amounts of people that were dependent on the government to feed them. Yes. You know, that's why Rome fell. I'd be happy to fight anybody that wants to argue about that. Right. And a lot of people depend on the government and feed them, especially what we're seeing right now. You know, the, the articles came out in the past few days that in New York, the lines are a lot longer than they have ever been, you know, ever in the history. Uh, there's lines everywhere, North Carolina, uh, Texas, California, Washington State. And the government is giving out a lot of money, printing a lot of money so people can eat. But my, my thing is that they have to understand that one day that safety net may not be there anymore, you know. Because exactly we, right. We print ourselves out of existence. Well, and, you know, the, the, the problem with a safety net is it has a tendency to become a hammock. Right. And that's perfect. You know, way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> you know it, the, the only thing more permanent than a temporary government program is a permanent government program. Yeah. I mean, it. I, I see the, the coronavirus stimulus checks that they've been throwing around and sending out. Like, that's just like the easy way to ease us into universal basic income. Mm -hmm. And I don't like it. I don't like the way, I don't like the way the country is going. And, you know, because I don't, because I don't take sides in politics, I'll say this, that I definitely think that, you know, we're, we're closer than we've ever been to major, to major fundamental change in our society. Like, and I'm thinking we're, we're, we're going to be coming close to governmental shift and that will probably be first to the left and then it may be back to the right, but you know, the pendulum swings left to right, you know, the, the political pendulum swings left to right and eventually it comes off the rails and we're due for a reset and I think we're due for a reset. We're due for, we're due for an economic reset. We're due for a political reset. Yeah. I believe that myself too. We were seeing all the signs of it. I mean, not, not just the fact that out of Davos, they have actually used that phrase, you know, who <laughs> reason the, the planet, but we're seeing all this stuff in place that they've been doing for a long time. So it's not hard to miss. It's just people are not paying attention to it. So, we, we've talked about energy and we've talked a little bit about, you know, value. Okay. So this is how screwed up like economically we are in the big picture. So if it takes approximately 500 man hours to replicate the energy in one gallon of gasoline. So let's put that into context. Okay. You have a car. You want to drive that car down the road and you go as far as you can go on that gallon of gas. It would take 500 guys pushing for one hour to move you the same distance. Okay. Now the value ratio, and this is where everything is screwed up. What's that gallon of gas cost you today? Depends two bucks. Yeah. Two bucks. I am two, three bucks, like four if you're in California. What's that, what's that hour of a man's time going to cost you? much less find 500 guys that are willing to push a car at max effort for an hour. What are they going to cost you? Right. So, you know, there, there's a big disparity there that has to be addressed at some point. Yeah. It'll come due one day. 
All right. Well, I, I want to thank you so much for, for coming to the, to the podcast and having this conversation today. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you, you'll want to come back later in the future and, and have more conversations with me. I'd, I'd be happy to do that in the future. And, uh, you know, I hope we're able to do that in the future. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're a couple of weeks away from the election and we'll see how that turns out. So hopefully oh. you, your area is safe from any unrest. I'm I'm 20 miles away from a community of 20 of uh, 2,000 people. I'm almost 100 miles away from a community of over 15,000. <laughs> so I'm pretty far out here. Like I mean, things are gonna have to get pretty serious. Like I mean, we we actually have discussed this. I mean, I have a bug out plan from here. But like my bug out plan from here is, you know, there's roving armed gangs running around. I mean, I'm so far out in the country, but if there's roving armed gangs out here, buddy, like I'm going hiding, living in a tent on the ranch and you're not going to see me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. It, it'll, it'll have to get really bad to get to that point. But you know, I'm. Yeah. Hey, I, maybe yeah. I, now, that, now that I'm thinking about it on the, on the next podcast, we could probably discuss what could actually set off a chain of events that would cause you being so far out, you know, so remote for you to have to bug out, you know, because it's going to be people in the city first suburbs, but for someone who is so remote to actually have to flee, something's going to have to be going on there. Uh, roping armed gang stage. And, and I think really, you know, one of like another big indicator would be like, if there was a total media blackout, like if we lost phone service, internet service, and you know things just went completely dark, that's definitely a bug out signal for me. But uh, you know, as long as the power stays on and the fuel kind of keeps flowing, um, I'll be okay for quite a while. All right. Well, thanks so much, Red Hills Rancher. I really appreciate it for coming to the podcast today. Great content, and thank you for all the information that you have provided us today. Well, I'm. Um, it was a pleasure to be here, and you know, I know I kind of say some controversial stuff, and I'm a little bit out there at times, but uh, somebody's got to push the envelope and, and and think new thoughts, I suppose. All right. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, audience, for watching this video. Thank you for being with us this hour, and I really appreciate it. Please take notes, understand what is uh, what was discussed today, and if there's any any doubts that you have, you can um, send me, send me a message, and if I have any questions, I'll ask. Red Hills Rancher, and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer your questions. But again, thank you very much for coming to the show. Have a good night. Have a good night too, sir. Thank you. The Man Ape Survival Show.